All right. Hello, everybody. So we've got some people on Zoom. We've got a bunch of people in the room here, too. So we're trying our first completely hybrid meeting where we're in person, but our speaker is coming to us from Washington State. So she's only at five o'clock in the afternoon there. But uh, this way we get every once in a while we're going to do this. We will have some speakers that are from um, with levels of expertise we just don't have in the in the city of Houston here. So welcome everybody. Um, Want to first just uh, mention that we have the mentor program. So if you need a mentor, see Wendy Hager. And she's got her hand held up for those on the people on the Zoom that can't see that. But uh, <laughs> here she is. Can you see her now? OK. Uh, and she's also doing an exhibit at the Houston Architecture Center. It starts here. Starts on May 18th. And it's something that I dreamed of about five years ago. But because of COVID, it didn't happen till now. It's called the Architecture of Bees. And it's looking at the parallels between human built environment and bee environment. Everything from looking at bee space, the concept of bee space, to evaporative cooling, to we got a waggle dance that you can do on the floor on footprints, like learn to dance. And it's got an architecture that's been inspired by hexagons and honeycombs. Okay. May 18th. It starts, starts May 18th. Yeah. And it'll still be going in July when we have our uh, Houston Beekeeper Association uh, annual happy hour meeting, which will be at the Houston Architecture Center. So we'll be able to see her exhibit and Wendy will probably talk to us a little bit more in depth about it at that time. So upcoming stuff for beekeepers to, to know about on the 26th um, is the uh, Harris County Beekeepers are having a meeting. And then also on the 26th, the at home Beekeepers, beekeeper series is going on and that's online deal. And then our next meeting is on the 17th of May for the Houston Beekeeper Series. So that'll be uh, Lynn James talking about uh, new laws uh, for selling honey in the state of Texas. And then um, on the 25th of June, the Texas Beekeeper Association is having their summer clinic. And that's a, it's actually just in Conroe, so it's not that far away from us. Okay, I'm going to let uh, Mike Simmons, Simmons take over now and introduce our speaker. Got it. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Susan Kobe. She's an acknowledged international authority in the field of instrumental insemination and honeybee breeding. She's established and maintains the New World Carniolan Closed Population Breeding Program, now in its 39th generation, a recognized industry standard and a model program for teaching. Her specialized training classes designed to teach the skills necessary for the selection and maintenance of honeybee stocks, attracts researchers and beekeepers worldwide. Uh, experiences include management of honeybee research laboratories at The Ohio University and the University of California, Davis. She developed an independent research program based focused on post instrumental insemination care and survival of queens. Uh, her extensive experience includes co-founding and operation of a commercial queen production business Vaca Valley Apiaries in California. Um, her current focus is on uh, the enhancement of US honeybee breeding stocks, honeybee germplasm of several European subspecies imported from their native homeland. Highly encourage any of y'all interested in that to research. It's pretty neat what she did with her. And uh, increased colony vitality and tolerance resistance to pests and disease. Uh, so I'll let her take over for now. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm gonna talk about queen rearing. I think this is the, can you hear me? Is that good? Okay. I'm gonna talk about queen rearing. I think this is one of the most fun aspects of beekeeping, but along with that is raising drones. I don't think we give the drones enough credit. And I think they're actually, they can be more difficult to raise than queens. Um, especially if you're off season a little bit or you have issues um, with chemical residues, weather conditions, things like that. So I'm just going to go through the, the kind of basic biology behind this. Uh, let's see, how do I, yeah. Okay, 
So that first of all, you just need to start with a good, strong, healthy colony. That means good nutrition, minimize the pests and diseases as, as, as much as possible, and also exposure to chemical residues. We live in a toxic environment. They're out there, but if you can minimize these as much as possible, because it really does affect the reproductive, especially sperm viability in the drones. So there's many little steps in this process. And the more you can optimize these, the better quality you're gonna get. It's not just the rearing condition, it's the genetic background of the stock, health, nutrition, all these different factors play and they need a lot of attention. For the rearing conditions, you look in these cells here, you can see the difference between the quality here and the quality here. Okay, so if I just sold you 100 queen cells and gave you these, I don't think you'd be very happy. And this is gonna influence the quality of that queen, the number of, of varials, how well she mates, spermatheca size, her capacity to uh, lay lots of eggs, and also her pheromone development, which is her language, won't be as strong. So you really need to put a lot of effort into raising quality cells. And that's really goes to the basic concept of nutrition. So if you look at these cells up here, they're different sizes. It, the person grafting here chose larvae of different sizes. You wanna graft the smallest larvae possible and you want them to be uniform in age as near as possible. So they get good nutrition, they could get proper feeding over the life of the, that feeding period. And that requires a high population of young nurse bees that have well-developed glands for the feeding behavior. So this timing is quite critical. Here you can see the end results of the, the difference in the cell size and quality here. That's age and it's also nutrition. So the difference between the queen and worker is basically the nutrition, which kicks in gene expression of these different casts. If you take a fertilized egg, it can take either pathway. And that's pretty much determined within the first two days of hatch. So you want that queen to be fed nutrient rich royal jelly to take that path going to the queen. You've got all these different morphological, behavioral, physiological, even longevity differences. There's like 50 different characteristics between that worker bee and that queen. So you wanna optimize those as much as possible. These are some of the, the differences, you know, size, development. It's amazing that this queen develops much faster than the worker, but she's fed these huge copious amounts of real jelly, which is high protein. And that kicks in all these different developmental different stages. Um, You've got differences in the, the sting, tongue length, mandibles, the corbicula, which is the pollen basket of worker bees, wax glands that worker bees have, the queens don't have these, but they have different things, the, the large mandibular glands, and that produces the, the pheromone, which she controls the colony with. Well-developed spermatheca, this is the sperm storage organ, where all that sperm is, is maintained over time. Um, and that real jelly food is, is hugely important. It changes over time. The diet those queen cells get will change with the age of the larvae over time. So it's really critical that you have lots of young nurse bees in there providing this. The real jelly, it's, it's high protein, it's high fat, it's also high sugar. The high sugar acts as what we call a phagostimulant. It means that it, it's a eating stimulant, it just forces them or stimulates those larvae to eat huge amounts, just gorge themselves. And it just should be swimming in that jelly. Whereas the worker larvae, they're kind of semi-starved and they're, they have a, there's a higher sugar content in there. They don't get that rich high protein feed like you have with a, the queen larvae. So that's a huge difference in nutrition. Um, lots of nurse bees, which to get those well-developed nurse bees, it, their rearing conditions are important. You need good nutrition. You need pollen. Different pollen from different sources have different levels of protein, nutrients, 
sterols, things like that. So it's important they get a, a wide range of pollens and uh, nectar, sugar syrup, whatever. But you want those young nurse bees in here. If you look at swarming, one of the big stimulus is, swarming is reproduction. One of the big stimulus is crowding. It's you have all these young nurse bees in there and they're just feeding like crazy. So the colony splits when they have that ample amount of uh, population. So if here you're looking at, this is a, a, a nurse bee, you're looking at the side view of the head. These are the hyperpharyngeal glands up here. They're, they look like little peas. Um, and when they're, they're newly emerged bees, it takes them a few days to develop these and they get very large and engorged. And by, as that bee ages into a field duties, these atrophy and they shrink up. So you want those bees when they're about eight to 12 days old. So they have these engorged glands that are good for feeding. That's really important. They also are good wax builders. I like to pick up a bee in my cell builder and see these little wax flakes in here. And this, this is a typical behavior of, of wax builders. They, they make these chains and just uh, form these little chains producing the wax. And, and you want your cells to have this nice fresh wax. You don't want them to have to scrape wax from other places and, and reform. So these bees are used to a little bit older on the side of the, uh, the young nurse bees with well-developed hyperpharyngeal glands, they go into this, they're doing lots of, lots of feeding of, of nectar and sugar syrup. That's expensive on wax production. You need a good honey flow. You know, when you get a start of the honey flow, you start seeing that wax building everywhere. Well, these, these are the guys that you really want in there doing that cell raising. So grafting, you wanna graft into, I like wax cups, I'm a bit old fashioned that way, but most of the commercial guys have now gone to the plastic cups. Doesn't really matter, your acceptance is pretty good, but the thing is you wanna get those larvae, I always say, the ones that are so small you can't see them, I'm wearing glasses now, or get one of those headlights would have the little magnifying um, eyepiece on them. So you want this larvae just newly, hatched within the first 24 hours. If you can get that 18 hour, 20 hours old, the smallest larvae you can see, and you can just, if, if the colony's well fed, you have a little bed of jelly in there, you can just scoop her up and transfer her over into the queen cups. Grafting is transferring into the queen cups. Okay. Here's your, here's your uh, little larvae. You can see the head capsule there. Um, it's, that's about the size you want. This is about uh, a, a day old, about 24 hours old. You wanna get them by day three, that, that cast has been determined and you miss some critical feeding time. So it's about the size of that, here's an egg here. It's just that newly hatched larvae in there, just about that size. And if she's well fed like that, you can scoop that um, into your queen cup. I like to prime the cells. Priming the cells is just to put a little drop of jelly in the bottom of each cell and you could float the larvae off. Most of the commercial guys do dry grafting because it's faster, but these little larvae, they dry out quite fast and it just gives you a, a little bed to um, take that off the, the grafting spoon and also to make sure she has some moisture there. The, the larvae you, or the, the jelly you give them is using not the proper rate. I usually take uh, jelly, dilute it 50%, throw it in the freezer. It's just a, a primer. The bees will recognize that is not the proper food and they will uh, remove it and put the proper food there. But it's, it's okay to cheat a little bit by priming the cells. I like to do that. Again, here's some different grafting tools. Doesn't matter what you use, uh, they're all effective. Um, I like a double lot paintbrush. Uh, this is a piece of uh, just a piece of wire shaped. You can use the um, uh, these Chinese grafting tools. Some people like those. Here's an automatic grafting tool. It doesn't really matter. I know someone that just takes a toothpick, chews the end, and uses that. Um, whatever works is good. You want to have high humidity if it's uh, and and warm conditions. 
I'm in the Pacific Northwest and sometimes it's cold. So I have a, a heating pad with a wet towel on top where I put my graph before it goes into the cell builder. Um, you, I know the California guys during that, the heat, they'll just throw a bucket of water on the floor, uh, something crazy like that, just to keep that moisture level high and warmth in there is what they need. You wanna get that, as soon as that bar is grafted, it goes directly into the cell bowl. It's nice to have somebody running those back and forth so you can just graft and, and get that on the bees as soon as possible. Here's the plastic cups. Just work well, there's really no difference between the acceptance rate of these. It's really the, the grafting uh, and the cell builder conditions that will make a big difference here. <clears throat> Again, nutrition is everything. You have this, we call it a social genotype, the nurse bees, the bees that are gonna take care of these cells. Um, when you put, you can do a queen right or a queen less system, but you want those nurse bees just waiting I like to use a queen less system. It's kind of an emergency system, but, and you have a little space in there where you put the cells. As soon as you put the cells in, you can just see the, the, the nurse bees all over those and taking care of them. Um, that's really important. Let's see. Um, again, the conditions are everything. Those cell builders, you want just a high, population ratio of young nurse bees. Instead of taking a big colony and knocking it down into a single deep to make it strong, I like to shake from several colonies the brood nest so I have a large population of young nurse bees. These are the ones that are gonna raise good queens. It's all about nutrition. And you wanna make sure those nurse bees are well fed. And the grafting, you want that to be really fast. You, um, if you're slow initially, Prime the cells, put that little bit of jelly in there. That gives you a little more time. Um, if you get a phone call, don't answer it or don't, or have your, and have your cell builders very close. Don't have to take them uh, a long distance away where the larvae could get chilled or dried. That's really important. Um, how many I graft? It depends on the season, the conditions. Uh, spring during swarm season, when all the conditions are perfect, you have lots of young nurse bees, you can stuff those pretty well. You can put uh, a frame of 60 or some of the commercial guys will do 120 in there. Later in the season, when conditions aren't quite as good, I'll scale down the numbers I'll put in there. I may put 15 or 20 cells in the cell builder. It all depends on the quality um, and how many nurse bees, the population size, nutritional conditions, all those factors play. I want my cell builders to look like this. I, I paint the, the bars. I can put the date or the queen and the queen mother on here. I always have nice pollen patties. I want a, a frame of pollen in there right next to the graph, but I also put pollen patties on there. I want more than she can possibly consume eat. There's a, a feeder here. You can see these wax builders just kind of hanging over the feeder area. Um, if you stuff, the easiest way to make a cell builder is just stuff like 10 pounds of bees in a single deep, lots of, lots of young nurse bees, put a feeder in there, a couple frames of pollen, a uh, couple frames of open nectar. I like to put a piece of foundation in there that, give, that keeps them busy with the wax building and they don't web the cells too badly. Um, you just wanna make, just think of a swarm, you're creating a swarm and kind of holding the bees in that state. This, uh, after you have your queen cells, this is kind of an assembly line of, of making up nooks. You got a, uh, right here is a sugar, putting in sugar in the feeder there, a couple bees, a queen cells. Then they go uh, into a cold room where that small cohesive unit is not stable until the virgin emerges in there. So once that virgin emerges, they take on her pheromone smell, and then you put them out in the field and open them up. But that's a kind of a critical stage for them. Um, you can see, a, here's a big cage of uh, bulk bees. So you've got somebody putting in a cup of bees, you've got somebody putting in a, a frame, an, an extra frame. That's, uh, but you can do this much, much easier, better yourself. If you have uh, 
what I usually do is run these in five frame nooks. That's expensive on bees, but for my purposes, it's okay. You can just split down the colony. Uh, if you have brood in there, it'll be stable. The reason they do it this way is these, these start off queenless. It's, um, it's pretty stressful initially. Um, drone production. These guys um, are expensive on the colony. I had a visiting researcher here and she was looking at rural jelly and these different things. And she took some samples of the drone jelly and she said that what they're feeding the drones is very similar to rural jelly. That's a big demand on the colony when you figure there's a thousand, 2000 drones in there. So these guys need to be well fed. Um, and all the, all the sperm production happens during their development. So if they're not, if you don't have the good protein, they're not well fed, um, you're not gonna get good sperm, sperm development or, and good mating. Usually if, if they're compromised in some way, they'll kick the drones out. You've seen them, they just kick the drones out for some, you got a, a patch of bad weather. Uh, we're seeing that now here. My spring is really late and the nights are near freezing still. It should be, we're like a month behind in the season and uh, they're, they're hard on the drones. The drones are pretty special right now, but they're hard on them. The bees don't, they usually don't like this full frame of drone comb. They like little patches, different places, but this is, this is just a way I can control uh, when they lay and how much they lay. Um, older queens like to lay more drones than young queens. And usually the older queens are the ones you're, you've selected and you can, you can, uh, you want to graft off of. So that, that works out. Okay. Um, development time. Look at that. Um, drones mature about three weeks. Their peak performance is about three weeks after emergence. So these queens are developing way faster. Um, 16 days and then they're ready to mate within five or six days after that so these drones they take longer to develop and then they take another two three weeks before they mature so these guys my basic rule is once i see see drones begin to emerge from the cells that's about the time i'll start grafting my queen cells because i figure it's 10 days out before they emerge. It's another, another week before she's ready to mate. So that kind of works out well. So if I don't see drones emerging, I don't start grafting. That's kind of a cold weather situation. And maybe you don't, you probably don't see that so much in Texas. You probably just have a barrage of drones early because of the weather. But um, so the, the whole mating strategy there is they go, they fly these like interconnecting flyways and then there's like a clearing space, maybe a clearing of trees or between uh, some hills or something like that. And they're, they're kind of fussy about the weather. If, if you don't have, if you have too much wind, drizzly rain, uh, temperatures are marginal, they won't fly. They're pretty fussy. But you need to form these congregating areas, which is about 10 to 30,000 drones. And usually that's made up of several hundred colonies. And it's a real genetic mix of different things. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a mating sign. Here's a queen just returning with a, a little mating sign. And this is a big excitement. She runs around the colony and the, she's got a, a barrage of, uh, escort of bees all excited following her around and that activity really helps promote the sperm migration so that's important for her so you can try to saturate your mating areas if you want more control over who the queen's mating with um, and if you figure there's a there's probably a thousand two thousand drones per colony during peak uh, production time, but half of those are gonna be immature. So figure a thousand colonies per drone, takes, it takes about 10,000 drones to make up one of these congregating areas. So if you can multiply that as best you can within, 
a half a mile, a mile, just surround your mating yard. And that'll give you pretty good control over uh, who those virgin queens mate with. So keep in mind these are, they're really perishable. They're really vulnerable to uh, all kinds of stressors. And that can really, um, you have a really high rate of attrition with drones, I guess is what I'm saying. And it could be, uh, they're kicked out for many reasons, pesticide residues, pest pathogens, temperature extremes if it gets too hot, not only a cold snap, but too much heat um, can cause problems with the sperm production. Um, all these things are really important for, for drones. And at the end of season, you've seen this behavior where the bees, they're, they're, when they're done with the season, these guys are kicked out. They're too expensive to maintain most of the, most of the year. Um, these are just some mating yards, different, different areas. Um, these are the little styrofoam mating nooks. Um, these are little wooden mating nooks. These are like two ways. They have a uh, uh, divider down the center. So they have openings for queens on both sides. Uh, these are, this is another, these are again, styrofoam mating nooks. So uh, it, it's kind of, I guess, unusual to have that concentration naturally, but the commercial production, that's, that's what they do. Taking a peek inside these, this is one of the little styrofoam nooks. Um, you want to you put your cup of bees in there, queen cells, some syrup, and come back in two weeks and look for eggs. Um, usually these, these uh, are easier to manipulate. If one doesn't take, you can switch brood. You can put a frame of brood in there and switch them around, things like that. So they're very efficient in, in those terms. Um, again, here's the mating sign. It was a drone. Uh, I don't know if you've ever watched these drones just before flight time. They they sit on the flight board and they're like they're like boys going to the to the prom. They're like covering their antenna, getting ready. Um, they're they're quite funny to watch. Uh, the mating flights uh, most most uh, it depends how what the drone population is, how well mated she is. The queen has a perception of how well filled. Mythica is, and if she doesn't mate well the first time, she'll go out and take another mating flight. Um, and then all these different physiological changes occur. These queens can mate up to, I think they've clocked 60 different drones, which is amazing, but most average about 15, 20 different mates. If they mate with less than that, um, it could be just really good weather, really good success rate of mating. And it, if they mate with 10, 15, maybe that's adequate sometimes, but the mating is important. Um, and the reason for that is the more genetic diversity you have within the colony, which I mean, the more drones that queen is made with and the more diverse they are genetically to her background, the more fitness you have. Their whole strategy is outcrossing. If you look at that mating flight, it's really risky business going out there. There's birds and dragonflies and all kinds of things that want to eat you. Um, and then after she's done with that mating, she discards about 90% of the sperm she collected. So she's only going to maintain about 10% from that mix of drones, but she takes semen from all the drones. So what you see here is this is the abdomen of the queen and the drone during mating. And this is the oviducts. Right here is where all the semen is collected. And it takes about 40 hours for this to migrate up into the spermatheca. But during that time, this is mixing. So she's taking a little bit of sperm from everybody. So that gives her that genetic diversity. And then she expels the rest. Very inefficient, but it's very efficient in terms of maintaining that genetic diversity, which is so critical for her fitness. Um, again, lots of little steps in this process um, from, from setting up cell builders, grafting, getting good matings, um, all these things are important. 
If you look at a frame of queen cells, you want them just covered with bees. If you look at the, look at how this is set up. He's, um, the cells are not out to the end. If you get a cold night, you want them all clustered in the center. Um, and that, and they're away from the, the top bars. This is Pat Heikum, Heikum honeybees. Um, well, these are like two, three day old cells just to start. You can see them just started. But it's, it's really important to concentrate those in the center. Your cell builder should be super strong. So that temperature should not really be much of an uh, issue, but you wanna give them all that attention to detail. And the, the queen, if you look at a queen in a hive, you can kind of tell the quality of her. If she's got this nice retinue here, which is all this attention, she's got her pheromone language says, I'm well mated, I'm well reared, I'm healthy, I'm young, I'm vigorous, I'm an egg machine. So that's what you wanna see. If you have a queen where they're not paying a lot of attention to, there may be some deficiencies there. Um, extreme polyandry, what I mean by that is, Polly means many Andrew drones, many drones. She's made it with many drones. So there's been a bunch of studies shown that the more drones she mated with, the more attractive she is, the better her pheromone bouquet, the more successful she is in having lots of different traits within the colony, overwintering, production, less susceptibility to diseases and environmental change. You may have, if you look at each drone, um, all the sperm is identical. It's like a clone. So you have these different subfamilies of worker bees with different fathers, and they may have different traits. You may have some that are more resistant to some virus or more resistant to, or more have more, one subfamily that has more hygienic behavior or whatever. The more diversity of traits within that colony, the more fitness you have, the general fitness you have. <clears throat> so again, your quality, the sperm viability, I, I want to harp on these drones because they just don't get enough concern. I, I think it's more difficult to raise lots of healthy, strong drones than it is a few queens. And you need lots of drones. Nutrition is a huge factor. Colony health, uh, pathogens, Varroa, you need to keep these levels down, but you also need to minimize the exposure to miticides, pesticides residue in the environment, temperature extremes, all these things they're super sensitive to. The drone is not essential for that colony. And if you have stressors, they're the first to go, the first to get kicked out. So pay attention to these boys. They have really high value um, and they're very seasonal. If it's, if it's springtime, swarm season, they seem very plentiful, easy to rear, but you get a little bit off season um, and they can be very difficult to maintain. Especially the, the cold weather bees, the darker races. Um, I, I, there's been many times when I've tried to extend the season a little bit, maintain those drones to the fall season and you get a little bit of a cold snap, a little bit of a dearth period and they just kick them out. They are done with taking care of those drones. So you need to kind of follow the season. It's much easier than trying to, to, to fight the season like that. Here's a quick little test to look at maturity. Um, some drones, if they don't have good nutrition, just may not yield semen. They look good, but they just don't have semen. This is a nice test you can use. Um, on the top here, the, these are immature drones. And this, this is an immature drone. Uh, it's kind of a two-step two two process, the partial aversion and the full aversion. So this is the partial aversion where these claspers have no color. And here you can see they have color. The color, he, th these claspers are, are kind of what fit into that vaginal pouch during flying because it, it's the mating is fast. They'll mate like bam, bam, bam in a row. And they have this kind of, uh, and this is part of the mating sign too, that endophallus is, it has some ultraviolet characteristics. So that makes the queen actually more attractive. 
it. So the next drone flips that out and mates with her. And this happens within seconds. It's very fast. Um, this is the full end of phallus. So if you, if you take this partial aversion and roll your fingers along the sides, you're actually turning it inside out. And then you end up with a full aversion, which is what you see here. Here's the claspers, which are right here. So you have this, um, the semen is exposed. It's on a, 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 a bed of mucus, which is kind of a pearly white. Um, and this endophallus here, you can see it has no mucus, no semen. It's, it's immature still, or it just hasn't been, uh, had proper nutrition. So again, these little orangey yellow clasper things um, indicate maturity, but you really have to expose the semen, which is kind of a creamy coffee au lait color. And uh, sometimes if you pop those drones, you'll see just white. White is just mucus. That means that the drone is not mature or, or doesn't yield semen. So that's a quick little field test you can do. Um, this is an amazing organ, the spermatheca, how she maintains that sperm for years. There's a, this is the spermatheca and there's little, there's a, a tracheal net, which is, it provides oxygen. There's also some little glands that provide nutrients. We really don't know the secret of all this yet, but this organ is amazing. What you see here are, these are tiny little sperm cells. They, they're, the heads are very tiny with a long tail. You would think they would just get all curled up and tangled in this mess, but they, they don't. That's, uh, this is as curly. If you look at it, it uh, under the microscope, you'll just see this kind of swirly, curly coffee au lait. It's quite pretty, but that's a, that's a close up of the sperm cells, kind of amazing. Um, and okay, if you, if you buy queens or if you have bad weather and you wanna test the quality of how much sperm she has, or if the queens are mated, say you've had a run of bad weather and you're not sure if they mated well. Um, old queens, I always, I always look at the spermatheca in, at, in an old queen before I kill her just to kind of give me a, a gauge of how well she made it. Um, so if you grab the very last segment, top and bottom with your fingernails, a pair of forceps, whatever, and pull, you'll see, a, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little round ball in there. And this is the, the spermatheca. It looks rough and white. If you roll it in your fingers, you can, uh, the tracheal net will fall away and you'll have the spermatheca. When you first see this with the tracheal net, it's, it's white, you can't really tell. Once you um, peel away the tracheal net, you can see the spermatheca. And what you get here is, here's a, here's a bunch of spermathecas from an insemination class I did. The, the virgin is, is clear. It looks like a diamond. It's just uh, clear, crystal clear, really pretty. The spermathecas um, have kind of a creamy coffee au lait color. Um, these are partially, you can see these have some color in it. This, this is a pretty good one. Some of these still have parts of the tracheal net on there, but you can kind of see the difference between those two. So this has the, the tracheal net on it still. So we don't know the status of that queen just yet. Um, again, here's the, here's the virgin, just that uh, clear, almost looks like a diamond or something. The, the tracheal net, which has been peeled off. And this is the spermatheca of a mated queen. It has a kind of that marbly coffee au lait color, uh, which is the same. If you pop a mature drone, it'll look the same as that color, just kind of a marbly. Um, again, here's the spermatheca with the tracheal net covering. It looks rough and white. Um, this queen is, notice it's kind of milky. It doesn't look well filled compared to this one. So this is a failing queen or a poorly mated queen. Usually if you have a queen that's two or three years old, she'll look more like this. Um, she's just kind of run out of sperm. They never go clear again, but they, they get kind of this milky color. And by that time, Often 
she turns into a drone layer if she's uh, that depleted in sperm. So this is a quick little test you can do. Um, stressors, if you're, the colony can kind of tell you what's going on. You just kind of read it. If you're getting a lot of, you have a queen with lots of supersedure attempts, uh, oftentimes they always seem to win. They always raise a new virgin. If that queen is poorly mated, she doesn't have a nice retinue uh, for whatever reason. They seem to know way before you do. Uh, some of that is the, the brood pattern. If she didn't mate well, or if she mated with drones that were too close or related, you'll have kind of a spotty brood pattern, or she's not laying well. The bees are, they're reading her, her pheromone, their, her production level. Uh, you've got an old queen starting to fail. She's not up to par, so they, they start trying to supersede her. Uh, genetic diversity is a big thing. If you mate a queen that's well mated with good genetic diversity, that brood pattern is solid and she's a good, a good layer. Usually that's uh, what you wanna see. Um, there's a lot of different stressors in our environment now. Malnutrition, it's really hard to get that good field of flowers to provide good nutrition. We can give them protein supplements, but we really don't have anything that can replace natural pollen at this stage. We can get them through dearth periods, but to raise queens, you really need that good, healthy, diverse, diversity of different pollens to provide the nutrition they need. That's really important for raising queens. I, uh, the springtime I'll, I'll take frames of pollen and just stick it in the freezer and then pull that back out and feed it back to the cell builders. You, you just can't replace that natural pollen. You can collect it, freeze it, make patties, um, but use natural pollen over supplements. It, you'll just get better results in general. Um, again, poor conditions, poorly mated, poor sperm quality, injury infection, aging queen, all these things, all these factors play. Um, it seems like queens used to last longer than they do now, but I think you're exposed to so much more uh, toxins in the environment and, and we push them, especially commercially, we push those colonies way harder than we used to. Um, and if you've got, yeah, pathogen levels, viruses, uh, the, and if on top of malnutrition, these things kind of tumble down and, and cause more problems. Um, it's, it's about colony health. If you can keep those colonies as healthy as possible, you're gonna have a good, good quality queens. Um, oh, this is a, a vi we're doing a series of three videos. This one, is, this one is on selection breeding. It's also on YouTube. Um, I'm redoing one on instrumental insemination, and the third one's going to be on cryopreservation techniques. Um, these will be free online. If you go to the Washington State University website, it'll be posted there. Um, and we're, and we're um, oh, Jacob. This is my Polish friend, Jacob. We, we like to do these uh, bee beard things and he did a really nice one here. Um, I'll be, Texas A&M is having a queen rearing class. I don't know if any of you guys have um, gone to that before, but uh, Juliana runs those every year. I think we skipped a couple of years due to the pandemic situation, but we're gonna offer another one. This will be uh, May, 20th, someplace around there, 20, 21st, somewhere. Um, so look for that on the Texas A&M website. And um, do we have time for questions? Well, are you guys muted? Uh, I don't know if you have time for questions. Or... Yes, we do. Good. Good. I went through that kind of fast when I, what I was trying to give you is more the, the concept of it, not necessarily methodology. If you understand it, it's all about nutrition. If you can provide good nutrition, crowded hive conditions, lots of young nurse bees, you can make good queen cells. Uh, 
Okay. Who's do we have, do we have any questions on the chat um, or from the audience here? Are we overwhelmed? I have a question. Like, what if you only needed, like, say, five queens for your own personal use, right? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, you could just use a five frame nook and put like two, three pounds of bees in there, lots of young nurse bees. Do the same thing, just scale it down. Make sure you have a good frame of pollen in there, um, a open nectar, maybe a piece of foundation and a feeder and just dump three pounds of bees in there. So they're, I, I like the boxes to be crowded so they're hanging out the front, just really strong. And then just graft your um, five, 10 cells and do it right in the center, put them all in the center together. Yeah, you don't have to do the massive big cell builder if you only need a few, but it's the quality, it's nutrition. Young nurse bees, crowded, good nutrition. We have another question. So when you're looking for the day old larva, you're using your glasses there. How do you see through those glasses with your bee hood on? Because I, uh, I see the pictures of everybody working their bees with no hood or anything. They have a mint Yeah, No, I, I usually take the frame. It, I have a little grafting house, or you could do this in the front seat of your car. Get one of those OptiLights. It's a, a, it has like 3X magnification and a, a light on it. So you can see directly into the cells. Um, it, it's too hard to do out in the field, I think. Um, I, I just have a little grafting thing where I have a, uh, a stand where I can put my frame. I put my frame upside down because the cells face down so you can see in there very well and just have that light directly in there. You want a cool light. You, you want like those uh, fiber optic lights or something that doesn't make a lot of heat. And just, you got that little C shape of, of the larvae and just, just lift that up and put it in your, your queen cell. So how many how many people have tried raising queen cells, raising queens? In that we have box? one hand up here. Oh, this this is the Mine most fun part of beekeeping, I think. There's nothing better than going through those boxes and seeing that brand new fat plump queen just doing her job. Um, really fun, and it's it's uh, it's something you can do. Do it on a small scale. It's fine. But you can do, you can give so much more attention to detail and quality with your own queens. Was that one frame you showed that was covered in drone cells? Is that a drone foundation? Yeah, it's the, the green drone foundation. They colored green so it stands out a little bit. Um, that's a tall order for a colony. Um, I do it because, well, for insemination, I want to, I want specific stock and I want specific time. So I, I use that. Um, it's also a great Varroa food. If you're going to raise drones like that, be careful <laughs> because um, the end of the season, I throw those in the freezer and I feed it to the chickens. I've got people that will come by and pick up my drone comb. Um, it, that's one way to lower the levels a little bit. Um, but yeah, uh, drones are, the, the, during this, the, the season, the, they'll naturally make drones. All colonies will naturally, healthy colonies will naturally make drones. So I don't think you need to put that much effort into it. Um, and they naturally kick them out when they're finished during the season. But they like, they like patches. They don't like that one huge thing. I usually give that to the, um, the old breeders. I'll, I'll have them lay it out and then I'll put it out in colonies just to get her stock uh, moved around a little bit more. So there's a question here. How do you feel about the idea of leaving your neighborhood yard to, I guess, grow up in flower slavery, take it over someplace more flowers 
in the spring to allow for better forage. Oh yeah, you you need to chase the forage and you know take around a case of honey, do whatever bribery you need to get that floral source. Um, yeah, that's really important to get that natural pollen in there. And most people are very accommodating. Most people really like to sit there and watch the colonies and help you with that if you explain what you're doing. There, there's a lot of uh, oh, love of the environment and the importance of bees. So that's easy to do. And a jar of honey helps a lot. <laughs> Okay, do we have any other questions? All right, thank you, Susan. That's great. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Thank you guys a lot. And I, I hope you'll try some queen rearing because again, I think it's the most fun part of the keeping. So take care. Okay. Thanks for the invitation. All right. Let's see, just a reminder on the uh, upcoming events. Uh, Chris County Beekeepers on the 26th. Uh, also on the 26th is the at-home beekeeping, uh, what's that called? Beekeeping series, which is uh, a Zoom thing. And May 17th will be our next meeting. That'll be here. Um, May 18th, is that the opening of Wendy's? space human space show at the Houston Architecture Center which is downtown and I'm sure we'll put that in a step so everybody can go if they want to and that's open from May 18th through, through mid-August so and then um, in June is the Texas Beekeeper Association meeting and in July we're going to have our meeting we're going to hold our meeting at the Houston Architecture Center our kind of our annual kind of happy hour meeting and social social meeting and we can all see Wendy's so it'll be kind of fun. And Mike, turn it back over to you to do the uh, door prizes. Any other questions for anybody? I'll just say, you know, if, if you haven't ever tried queenery, if you, you know, if you're a competent beekeeper and you have two or three colonies, try it out. It's, it's super fun. The only, the only thing I'll say is, is if you're first doing it, you expect about at least 20% losses at each stage. So when you graft your cells, expect 20 of those not to take. When you do your mating flights, expect 20% of them not to come back. So, you know, if you want five queens, you might start with 15, maybe 20. But, uh, you know, even a small cell builder will do, will do that, no problem. Yeah, hold on, we'll get over. So number one. Number one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pick a door prize. Uh, the door prize this month came from Dayton and Man Lake. Uh, next number is ten. Perry. Perry Harrell. Three, which was Johnny. Angel, I said it right. And then number eight, Ray Hill. All right. Okay, that's it for tonight. Um, see you guys on 17th.